Hello, everyone, and welcome to California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. For the month of July, the California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines video series shifts gears to focus on California in a global context, bringing in thought leaders in wine from across disciplines to weigh in on the state of California wine on the world stage. The goal of these conversations is to lend perspective from the outside in so that the international and domestic trade audience gains a more comprehensive view of the Golden State's wine industry, past, present, and future. Today, we welcome Rajat Parr. Before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use. We have a chat section as well as a Q&A section. So these are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate uh, with other participants. Uh, just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. Then there's the Q&A section, and this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Raj to answer towards the end of the webinar. Uh, we will do our best to address your questions, but please know any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary in the email you'll receive following the program. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American Specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and Vanitaly as one of the world's top five wine communicators of the year for the last two years in a row. And Rajat. Rajat is a three-time James Beard Award winner and regarded as one of the world's foremost experts on wine. He's a trained chef and celebrated sommelier, having managed the wine lists of some of the finest restaurants in the USA. His winemaking projects include Sandy and Domaine de la Cote in the Santa Rita Hills with Sashi Mormon and Evening Land Vineyards in the Eola Amity Hills of Oregon. So now Elaine, I'll turn it over to you to start the conversation. Hey Raj, it's good to see you. Good to see you. I want to actually start by um, having you tell a specific story from your history in wine, <clears throat> because I feel like it's so evocative of the work that you've done and how you've gotten to where you are now. And, and it's a great reminder about, you know, your experience with restaurants. One of the things that's so unique about you in having a com conversation of this sort is that your experiences, you have thoroughgoing restaurant experience and perspective on wine in that kind of setting, but you also have really uh, connections with top producers literally all over the world and really intimate knowledge with their wine growing and winemaking. And then you also, of course, are a wine producer yourself. So bringing those three things together in one person is really quite remarkable. But I was hoping that we could start by having you tell us literally how you got your first restaurant job. You just finished at the CIA in New York, were trained as a chef, and then came over to California. So how did that go? Uh, it, it went in a way I had never expected it because I was going to graduate. This was, uh, I think, in September of 96. I was going to graduate and I was going to uh, head back home to India. And then I discovered that I have six-month uh, work visa. So I'm thinking I might as well like, go work somewhere. Uh, and just around that time, we had our wine class at the – the Colony Institute of America, and I truly fell in love with wine. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. This is uh, something as a kid, you eat grapes. You're like, yeah, you know, in India, the wine wasn't, you know, it wasn't something you would drink at home or my parents or anybody else. So I said, okay, you know what? I have six months. Let's go and learn about wine. And I applied for, for I don't know, I think I sent out 65 resumes, and I got two responses uh, offered me jobs as line cooks. So I guess no one read my cover letter because it was clear that I wanted to work in wine. And then, um, and then I, w I found Larry Stone through Daniel Jonas, who uh, did not uh, hire me at the time because he already had an assistant. So then I found Larry Stone uh, at Rubicon and I wrote to him and then I got a call back from a manager 
saying, uh, yeah, you know, we want to interview you. So I'm so excited now. I'm like, I'm going to go, you know, interview Larry Stone. So, you know, I borrow money from a friend of mine and buy a one-way ticket. I'm staying with a friend. In uh, San Francisco, that, right? In San Francisco, yeah. So yeah, because just to give context to Rubicon at the time was really considered one of the top restaurants in America, but here in San Francisco. Yeah. In, <laughs> and uh, so I kind of, flew from New York to San Francisco, a friend picked me up and went straight to the interview and I go in the interview and this the manager is like, oh yeah, um, you know, we'd love to hire you a food runner position. And I was like, huh, that's interesting because, you know, I'm expecting that maybe I'll get a, a, a sommelier job or like a seller master or something. But she's like, all we have is food runners. So I'm like, I'm here. I can't go back. I got no money to go back. I got six months to kill. So I thought I might as well just start wherever so i started as food runner and that's so i met larry stone maybe a few weeks after that and i asked him to um you know like see the time to train me he's like i'm too busy working but you know once i'm working and then saturday class saturday blind tasting and i'm that's how i started he threw a blind tasting every saturday for the staff and opened wines from the cellar and so i learned I learned through that and then reading and then six months later I became his assistant and I worked with him for three years. Well, and becoming the assistant was really down to the wire. You were hitting the <laughs> visa limit, right? And oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, visa. I, I, I thought I would work there. I didn't tell him about the visa part until month five maybe and I'm like, I think I have to leave in a month because I don't have, you know, I can't stay for more than six months. And he's like, oh, we'll just sponsor you. I'm like, really? So that's how he kind of just, literally I got my, I got my stamp on my passport like maybe like three or four days before my visa expired to extend to get a work visa. And yeah, so it was definitely, <laughs> it, would, it just happened like, yeah. And then I stayed yeah. and then I, yeah, so that was. One of the things too, though, is like, I know um, as I've spoken with you and Larry about that story, your, your ability to blind taste, even as you were still accumulating wine knowledge, like really stood out from the beginning, but also your work ethic, you know, you, you got hired as a food runner, but took on all this extra time to help in the, help move wines in the cellar inventory and also um, do all the tastings on the side just to pick up extra knowledge. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have, you know, I, I only have six months to learn as much about wine as I can. So I, I wasn't even sure I'd stay or I could stay. So I had to maximize. So I used to work all day. I used to just come to the restaurant in at like, you know, whenever, you know, like 9, 30, 10, uh, work lunch service, put box away, and then, and then just stay in the evening and help and just be there. So pretty much worked every day. And then every Saturday, Every Sunday, I used to go to Napa, Sonoma, because restaurants closed on Sundays. I used to drive and see vineyards and go taste, you know, and then um, come back, come back for service. So it just, uh, yeah, just trying to absorb everything quickly. Well, in 96, you know, you and I have talked about what a pivotal year that was for California, too. You know, 96 is really this crucial year where Phylloxera has hit Napa Valley, and so everybody's replanting. But it's also the beginning of Icon, the Icon wine era. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you really got to taste the first releases of like Screaming Eagle and, and other wines along that line. Yeah, yeah. It was all, it was like, you know, because, and, you know, everyone knew Larry and he was, you know, Masson, yeah, he was on the floor every night. Uh, he was definitely the most celebrated. You know, he had won best song in the world, like France and French wines and MS and everything else. So all the winemakers came to him to show him the wines. And, since the restaurant is called Rubicon, which is the flagship wine of France Ford Coppola's winery, uh, it was a center of American wine. Uh, and I mean, California and Oregon and Washington, because Larry had ties with all three states. Uh, and um, so everyone came there. So I remember tasting first vintages of all these wines of Kogan or Harlan and Screaming Eagle. All They were like 92 was the first vintage for many of them. And of course, all the winemakers, the producers, they all came to the restaurant. So it was really special. And then on Larry's love for French wine was also, so we had like, you know, 
I mean, I don't know. We, I think we had a, we had a, at one point, Larry ordered a pallet of orange Jaye. Like mm-hmm. literally, it was wow. like 56 cases came all together to put that away. And all, you know, old Genta's Jervu and Raveno back to the 70s and Rias back to the 60s. And so the, it was an enormous. Also, wine was much cheaper then. So it was a, the, the exposure to, uh, to California wine, old California wine, old Diamond Creeks and everything else, along with just everything from Europe was, was pretty mind-blowing. And to see how many events we did, he had a wine dinner planned like, you know, every few weeks. And this is not with the sales job. This is like the wine, the producer is yeah, there. Yeah. And, and, they, and back then, you know, there was, you know, old vintages, you go back, you know, because the restaurant was focused on food and wine uh, so much that, you know, Larry, Larry loved that concept of, you know, and so he really did like, it's crazy. I learned about food and wine pairing, just how intricate and, and, and how detailed Larry was with that. So it was, it was the education uh, like none other. For sure. Yeah. Well, and, and <clears throat> soon after that, Larry actually helped you connect with people so you could do your first trip to Burgundy and also Bordeaux. And a few years ago, I was um, visiting and you let me actually read your first tasting notebook <laughs> from Burgundy and, and Bordeaux. And like one of the wines that really stood out, you, you were actually getting to taste, you know, like Latour back into the 1880s, 1890s. And um, which is, you know, really incredible. And so this tape, you know, is a huge notebook from your first trip there. And you're getting to taste current releases and barrel tastings, but also incredibly old wines. And that really starts your kind of connection in France. And now, of course, you've, you've really become friends with a lot of those producers as well. Could you speak to that too? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, cause you know, again, all the winemakers came to the restaurant. And so I met a lot of people and Larry was really instrumental in introduced me to the winemakers, the producers, uh, you know, became friends the first time. I think I met Jeremy Sess from Ren Dujak there when he wasn't even a part of the family business. Um, and, and he was still studying in, in the UK. So it was really amazing to, to meet the people and to really get to know them. And then when I started traveling, I had a connection because they had been to the restaurant. Uh, and yeah, it was, you know, without that time, uh, at Rubicon, I don't think I'll have learned and met so many people that continue my travel. Because one thing I learned uh, early on was that the only way you can learn, uh, also remember, this is pre-Google. <laughs> pre- right, yeah, yeah. Internet was coming, it was there, but it was like, not like you could just go on, you know, it wasn't like you could go in and type in, you know, the soil type and it'll, it'll tell you what it was. Um, so I, I realized that the only way I could learn was either read books, ask Larry, or go to the place. So I decided I'm going to, uh, you know, save money and and plan one trip to Europe. And so I took my first uh, first real trip in '98, and uh, to um, to Burgundy and and Rhone. Uh, and then I've been there every year. I guess this I guess I, this might be the first year I'll miss going to. Uh, I've already been to Burgundy this year in January, luckily, but this might be the only year I haven't been to the Rhone maybe since 1998. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, pretty, pretty crazy to think. Uh, so yeah, and, and through the travels, that's, that's where you learn. I mean, really, I'm a visual person and the stories of the producers are, are so important. Yes. I think, I think that it's, uh, without that, there's, you know, no book can teach you, no video can teach you as much as when a producer with all his emotion and in his, in his, in his, on his own land telling you stories about, about that. Yeah. So, so in a, we'll talk more in a minute about your work with winemaking, but by, by the early 2000s, you start making wine in California. And then by uh, the late 2000s, you are also um, working as a negociant in Burgundy. So you've got experience in both places and since also Oregon, and we'll talk more about all of that in a minute. But at, you know, through all of this experience in the restaurants with producers and then also making wine in California, Oregon and, and, um, and in France, you've kind of arrived at this position, this view that Santa Rita Hills really is one of the, the greatest Chardonnay 
producing regions in the world. And so the first wine we're going to talk about is one of your um, Chardonnays from Santa Rita Hills. But, and, but I want to get us to talk about what is it about that place that makes it stand out for you. But let's go ahead and look at maps real quick so we can p kind of position that. And then um, we're, of course, also going to talk about Syrah. So the maps actually show us kind of three locations in California. <clears throat> and so um, just starting with the broad map, of course, we've got California. The, the important thing to remember is always that there on, on the western coast is the Pacific. And in fact, the current that runs along the west coast of California there is one of the coldest ocean currents in the world. And that really importantly informs wine growing in the entire state and especially with the three wines that we're gonna talk about with Raj today. But if we zoom into the second map, <clears throat> we can see um, more closely where we're talking about. And in a, in a little bit over the course of our conversation, we'll, we'll get an, even closer into these places. But the big point is that the three wines that Raj selected for us to talk about today, they're all incredibly coastally influenced. And what we'll see as we zoom in is the, um, each of the three vineyards, the three, the three areas that we're talking about, are actually exposed to the ocean. They're um, on the western side of the mountain ranges that they're near, and so they have direct ocean influence from those cold currents. So if we could zoom in some more, <clears throat> what we're gonna talk about first, you can see there, um, Katie's made this map that shows us where Santa Rita Hills is. But notice that the coastal range in the dark green, this is a Google map, so it's literally a satellite photo of um, this part of California. And you can see that the dark green um, is the coastal range covered in some trees. But notice that Santa Rita Hills is west of those mountains. And um, in fact, it's positioned there in between the ocean and the mountains means it's really profoundly exposed to really cold maritime fog and also um, ocean winds. And so it's an incredibly cool growing region. And Raj, we're, we're looking at your 2018 Chardonnay and you were, we were talking earlier about how 18, 19, and 20 really show that cooler coastal influence. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, the, the bare facts are that California, even though we are not literally in a drought, we are as a state in, in a severe drought. Um, and, and some vineyards and some, you know, there these these series of, uh, of whether uh, climatic change happened like in three, four, five year uh, cycles. Uh, we had a, a weather pattern between, so my first experience in Santa Rita Hills uh, was in 2004. Uh, and then, you know, until 2011, it rained like a lot. And you're like, oh, it's always wet here. Lompoc is always cold and foggy and, 12 rolls around 13, it's like sunny and, you know, you can see there's a change in the weather pattern. 13, 14, 15, all severe drought vintages. 16, we got some rain, but again, 17. And now we are in a 18, 19, 20 is this kind of, you know, very uh, cool vintage. Um, in, I think 18, we had like maybe one day above 90 degrees and, 19, I think we like same, similar. And this year has also been the same. It's been really cool. So high mildew pressure and, but very cool vintages. So uh, very high acidity. I mean, you're talking of like, you have ripe grapes at potential alcohol of 13, 13 and a half with very high acid, uh, you know, pH is just around 3.0. And total acidities, you know, between nine to eleven grams, wow. um, which is sparkling wine levels. Yeah. Um, well, and so let's go ahead and look at the first slide for the 2018 um, Chardonnay. But, but again, one of the th the key things about this particular vintage of of the 2018 Chardonnay is it it has um, even brighter, more lifted acidity than the previous vintages, but yeah. in a region that that tends towards naturally high acidity too. So it's really quite a lifted, um, higher, slightly higher toned year. Um, but the, you know, I mean, it's, and one of the things a lot of people don't realize too is Santa Rita Hills is a region that um, rather than waiting on ripeness, you often have to wait on, on acidity and, and, and that decreasing. So could you speak a little bit just to that, but also, you know, what is it about that region that, 
that me- makes you say you believe it's one of the top Chardonnay places in the world? Uh, for a few reasons, of course, the weather being uh, conducive for slow ripening mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, flowering, bud break can happen quite early, but you have a very cool June and July. Um, you get some warmth in August, but then the warmest days usually come end of September into October. You can have Indian summer well into middle of October. So, you know, Chardonnay gets a very long uh, ripening process and really, uh, you know, the skins are nice and yellow and acidity is quite high and the pH is very low. So it's a perfect place to make, uh, make high acid Chardonnay. Uh, you can make it, you can pick it even later if you really want to and make a really voluptuous wine if you want. Uh, you know, I like something more fresh in the middle. Me and Sashi have decided where the style of wine we like. Um, and, and the soils are very interesting. We have um, a diatomaceous, which is pure silica. Um, well, in one of the I, few regions in the world where vines are planted in diatomaceous earth as well. Yeah, absolutely. And they are very, uh, very shallow soils in, on the hillsides, deeper if you're on the valley floor. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, chert, which is also referred to as silex. Uh, and that's a lot of silex. And there's pockets of calcareous material. There's not there's not real limestone on the southern part, so we focus only on one section of San Rita Hills. Mm-hmm. Of course, the northern section, there are some pockets of limestone also. In the southern section, there are some pockets of, of but not real limestone slabs. There are some, but it's mostly calcareous broken down in the clay. So mm-hmm. uh, that is very, you know, and also you have the fog influence. So the wines have a kind of a salty, uh, character so it kind of accentuates the acidity even more, especially in red wine. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it's a very, uh, I think, um, not easy to grow because mildew pressure is super high. Uh, if you're organic, uh, it's of course you know. If you're not organic, you can. Uh, it's slightly easier if you're <laughs> organic. You have to have so many sprays, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's you know it's a. It's interesting, but you, but you have pros and cons and being both. Uh, this wine we are tasting is mostly from our own vineyard, from, from vines planted just below Memorius at Domingo de la Cote, and uh, another vineyard which, uh, which we uh, buy the grapes from, also organic. So, you know, it's very important to have that kind of quality because you smell the wine, it's, it's very, uh, you have that kind of raw tropical note, but the acidity and the palate, the saline flavors uh, really kind of make it, um, you know, big impact Chardonnay. Even at like, this is, I think it's just around 13%, slightly under 13% alcohol. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's very fresh. And these wines will age really well, you know, and, and they don't need acidification or chapterization, right. no <laughs> substance added in the wine except at, uh, at bottling. So it spends 12 months in in 500 liter barrels um, and then another four to this month, five months uh, in, in stainless steel tank. And that's right before bottling, there's a little bit of sulfur added and, and is bottled. So it's very, it's a very, um, you know, uh, it's, it's very precise wine. And that's right. what the style of Sandy has been from the very first vintage. Well, and so just to clarify one of the questions that came in. So with organic farming, um, to deal with mildew you, uh, pressure, you, you use sulfur sprays. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things I really love about your Chardonnay, again, that kind of precision and, and um, clarity that you talked about. But there's but something that I've seen just from tasting all over the world myself is that those the longer growing seasons, it's almost as if it concentrates and fine tunes the flavors. So there's this real, you can end up with, you know, in your Chardonnays, you have this really incredibly light lifted laser like quality, but still with a lot of flavor density that's natural to the fruit. And I, and, you know, again, anecdotally, what I've seen is those really long, slow ripening um, growing areas like you have in Santa Rita Hills really help instill that kind of denser sense of um flavor but again you're you're so close to the coast you're you for a long time you really were the closest to the coast in the region 
Um, and people well, now have started pushing a little further to the coast as well. Eight miles from the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also, we want to be enough distance to get dormancy and, and, uh, and not to be too close to the ocean. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the most 80% of this is from our own vineyard. Uh, young vines, uh, uh, yeah. So one of the things people don't realize, you're so associated with Chardonnay and also with Pinot that a lot of people don't realize the first wine you ever made actually was Syrah. So could you tell us about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, uh, I was uh, at, a, at a late night, uh, I guess an after party after an event in Carmel, uh, Master of Wine, this is in 2003. And uh, we were just hanging out drinking, we were drinking some Gryo with uh, and my friend Seth, the late Seth Cunin, who was, who was with me and I was, and he had just started making wine. I think it was his, maybe he had maybe made two vintages and I'm like, Seth, you know, you should make wine like this, you know, whole cluster, 12 and a half percent alcohol, Syrah from Santa Barbara. He's like, oh, come on, you, you can't do this in California. It's impossible. You know, you won't get, you know, the lignification, da, da, da. I'm like, you know, I, I believed him. I said, okay, cool. That's, that's fine. It's, you know, I'm not going to like argue with Seth. I know at that point I did not ask many questions about growing and, and winemaking. And well, that, this is early 2000s. Too. 2003, yeah. And Seth had made, I guess, two vintages, three vintages by then. And uh, so I'm like, all right, let, I'm going to kind of find a vineyard where I'm going to try to, you know, make some whole cluster you know, Noak, uh, Syrah. So my quest started and I'm like, at that point, Sonoma Coast wasn't really like, no one, no one said Syrah, Sonoma Coast. And Napa was a little too warm for me, for me and I didn't know much in the North. I didn't know, know Santa Cruz. So, you know, I'm like, you know what, let's go, let's go South. And I started talking to people and I connected with uh, Steve Beckman and I was good friends with uh, Chad Melville. I'm still good friends with Chad Melville. And so I asked Chad, I said, you want to help me kind of like, you know, secure some grapes? He's like, sure. So when a Steve Beckman, his, he, he's, you know, one of the first biodynamically farmed vineyards here in Ballard Canyon. Right. And I said, I said, Steve, would you like sell me, you know, a ton or two of grapes? And he's like, oh yeah, sure. You know, I was like, I have no order to make it. Can I just like, you know, you know, borrow from Antra, make it. He, he's such a nice guy. He's like, yeah, yeah, of course, just do it. And the 04 vintage was the first vintage. And, and you know, time for harvest came and I was, you know, working, I was still working the floor full time. So, and we had just opened my Comina and I could not make it down for the pick. And of course, what, you know, you, you know, you'd rely on, on the phone or whatever. And we picked the grapes and it's too ripe. Oh. And the wine was just like, I'm like, oh, this is, Oh, so right. It's nothing like what I wanted. I was like, I was like, this is a disaster. Anyway, so you know what? You know, you, you know, you, I've I've taken my savings and I put it in this. Then and then, oh five comes and I'm there on top of it. We pick it, whole cluster fermented. The wine is like twelve point eight alcohol. Smells like olives and black pepper, and it smells like Syrah. And I'm so excited. I'm like, yes, this is great for Syrah. You know, this is this is exactly what I wanted. And that's how this thing all started. And I, and of course, I'm like, oh, I, I should have some white wine too. So, you know, so I convinced Jim Clendenin to sell me some juice from Sanford Benedict. He's, he had a big, pretty big section there. And I basically used to buy barrels, uh, usually like one new barrel and, and three old barrels. And he used to, when, when he picked it, he should just fill the, fill the barrels with the juice. And I made the wine there. I made the, the Beckman, the Serra, uh, Purusma Mountain at Beckman. And then I eventually met Sashi and, you know, started making it in, in Lampok and that's how it all started. Yeah. Yeah. Which I love, I just love the story and the progression and also who you got started with, you know, just icons of that region. But now, so our second wine, we actually are looking at Sashi's Syrah and, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Sashi as well and he really, um, credits his friendship with you as helping to influence the way that he thinks about wine and, and makes wine. And so, and I, I think this Syrah is such an example of kind of those conversations that you've had. It's certainly Sashi's wine, but it's also, I mean, I think he would say as well that the kind of expression that, that he's found here is 
is informed at least partially by the friendship the two of you have had and the Syrahs that you've exposed him to from France. But so could you, um, let's go ahead and look at the map again so we can see where Rimrock is located. Yeah. But, just, but just before we get into wines, I think I, I want to mention a few things about Syrah as a whole, because I think yeah, great. It's the most misunderstood grape in, in, I would say I'd take the whole new world into consideration here, because in the Northern Rhone, you know, of course we know, you know, Corvati is, you know, special Kornas, Hermitage, which is the king of all Syrahs. And, you know, we know all these places and, and they've been making wine here, there for, you know, thousand plus years. Uh, in the new world, <coughs> Syrah is, oh, it's another red grape. Let's make it like Cabernet or let's make mm -hmm. it, you know, I mean, let's make it, you know, closed tank. And, you know, Syrah in, in a way is more, um, more like Pinot Noir than Cabernet, for example. If you know, it, it, it likes whole cluster. It doesn't like new oak. It likes open top fermentation. There are certain, and but when early days when I tasted Syrahs from the '90s, there are very few producers who were really making the style of wine, which is now. Now there's so many producers who are like making wines, you know, with whole cluster, with no new oak, and making it light and fresh. I think it's not about Necessarily the place. I think yeah. the winemaking is the place. And whoever said that this vineyard, Rimrock Vineyard, in my mind, one of the most special vineyards. It's Syrah grafted on Chardonnay, on Rue Chardonnay. Uh -huh. um, and this is three miles from the ocean. Three miles from the ocean. It's crazy to think. And I, you know, I, I'm sometimes lucky to. Uh, to go to the vineyard and sample because I, I have a little little piece of uh, Pinot Noir, um, own Pinot Noir also in this in the same in the same area. So it's a pretty special. It looks it's just three miles and it's it's a, it's someone's backyard basically. Yeah. It doesn't even look like it's a real vineyard. It's just like someone's home home vineyard backyard. And also this wine, the evolution of of what Sashi and Melissa have done. In the in the vineyard uh, and and the winemaking, this is this is the first vintage. Um, you can see how how uh, you know Sashi has evolved in his own way. Of of you know he's a great winemaker and a great mind around wine, and then he kind of develops a new idea. Mm -hmm. And he, we, we, I mean, there's certain a part of this fermentation was was it, it fermented of with whole cluster. It was pressed, I think, maybe in end of January of 2018. So this was a whole wow, cluster yeah. in a closed tank for whatever, three and a half months. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a technique which we learned from Raul Perez, who's, who's a good friend, and he makes wine in, in, in Galicia. In Galicia, yeah. Yeah, and so this is a technique he uses, and we've kind of like you know adopted that into into uh, something. Of course, this is not the wine. I did not tell Sashi to make it. That no, way. of course, yeah. I, he, this is you know. I mean, I'm usually not around when the Syrah comes in. I'm I'm usually in Oregon by then. Uh, but uh, and uh, he, I found out about this technique, you know, a long time after. Uh, the wine was still in the tank. I'm like, why is that tank still full? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the rim rock. It's, I'm like, what? The whole, it's been sitting there for months. And, and here's, you know, this is really what Syrah is about peppery and olive and black, well, fruit, light on its feet, acidity, crunchy, fresh. Well, and it's really an amazing wine because the, um, you know, I've gotten to do verticals of, of rim rock with Sashi and, this wine has so much freshness, lightness, and tension. It's so incredibly lifted, but then really dynamic and flavorful in the mouth at the same time. And yeah. um, it's, it's just really cool to see how, how his work, their work with this wine has really evolved and with this site. And, and I, the site is also such a great example of how much there is left to discover with California and California wine. Cause like you were saying, it's this really unexpected vineyard. It's, it's a site that you wouldn't, expect to make great wine like this but the um you know this vintage especially i, I find really exciting because like you're saying that crunchiness and that lift and so much aromatic and you know I, I think a worry a person could have would be if you leave a wine on whole cluster for that long it could get dry you know um or stinky but but 
this wine is fresh and vibrant and so aromatic, you know, yeah. and it, it's really um, a testament to Sashi's kind of explore process of exploration. He's always willing to kind of advance how he thinks about any particular variety. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and also, you know, the wine is, you know, in concrete tanks and, and aged in old, old barrels and uh, small barrels and large barrels and, and, of course, a touch of sulfur and bottling. That's the only time it ever sees anything. So it's, it's a very, you know, it's, it's a very unique wine. And I think that the future of Syrah here in California is, is, is this coastal climate, you know. Syrah's grown. Uh, you, of course, there's a lot of famous Syrahs. Uh, which have been made from uh, slightly warmer sites and riper styles, and that's great. But really, the magic is the, in this freshness and this lightness. Mm -hmm. um, and I would challenge anyone to put this wine blind among um, any top Syrah from any top producers and identify it blind. I would I would bet some serious money on that. So. One of the most important tasting experiences I've ever had actually um, was with you and Sashi. Um, you put together a blind tasting of 10 Syrahs from around the world. And the 2014 Rim Rock was included in that. It's a relatively different vintage than the 17. But even so, the, um, the lineup was the you, you told us, okay, it's 10 Syrahs <laughs> from, from around the world. Um, one is, it was actually, one was not from France and one was not whole cluster. And we were told we had to identify which is not whole cluster and which is not French. And, and it was actually far, far more difficult than that might sound. But the, um, the big thing was that, you know, I've, I've done a few of these kinds of blind tastings with you and Sashi and the, watching you taste and what you look for has taught me so much about how to what to notice in a wine but then on sashi's side he he's relentless <laughs> he will he will um he has he has really pushed me to be um less fearful is the way to put it you know to like take a stand and, and own own what i know and and uh kind of demanded me to look into a wine and see what can i see but tasting with you has kind of taught me how to pay attention to a wine and see what I can see. And, and I, I, I totally agree with you though. Like the 14, I think the 14 Rimrock held up in that lineup, but I feel like this 17 stands up in that lineup, you know, it, yeah. with those, those best wines and really yeah. says a lot about how much more we've started to understand about the potential for Syrah here. Yeah. No, I mean, Coastal Syrah picked the right time. I mean, it has to be right. It can't be, you can't be picking underripe Syrah, which is nothing worse than green yeah. and underripe Syrah. So, you know, and then you have to, of course, the yields are very low here. This is like, it, the only way you can kind of ripen Syrah in, in cool climate, coastal climate is, you know, you can't hang four tons of <laughs> fruit per acre. This is, I think, I don't think it's ever had more than two tons an acre. Usually it's between one and one and a half tons an acre of, of, of this. Uh, of this. And, and that goes for a lot of coastal wines that, you know, the influence of the coast and the wind. Syrah does not like wind. That's one thing right, yeah. Syrah does not, does not like. And uh, I guess we've all learned from, you know, Bob Lindquist, who's, you know, the leader of all Syrahs. I, I mean, I remember I had an 82 Paso Robles Syrah from him. Well, and, I think that's his first year for Coupe, yeah. actually. Yeah, so yeah. it was like, and the wine was like, I think, 12-8 alcohol, fresh, and just, just so vibrant. Yeah, pretty, pretty incredible. Well, and it's fun, too, because he's, you know, he's no longer with Coupe, and so he's started, he's kind of returned to how he started with his new Linquist family wine and is making Syrah there again, which is exciting to see, but also very much from this colder, coastal-influenced area of San Luis Obispo. Oh yeah, no, I know the vineyard, and that's, I mean, Pinot Noir uh, struggles there, so I can only imagine what Syrah does. Yeah, um, so let's go ahead and look at um, going north now into really a profoundly different part of California. You know, so looking at our third wine is actually Syrah from a very coastally influenced portion of Sonoma, and I want to take a minute just to describe what we're seeing on this map because it, it it's really quite important to understand there. 
You can see that again, the dark green area is um, the forest covered mountains. And so you can see the mountains come like really form a, a quite a strong wall there on the western side of Sonoma County. But towards the bottom of Sonoma County there, just to the left of the vineyard marker, you can see that there's an opening in the coastal range. And it's quite a large opening actually. And so that's the Petaluma Gap area. And that that gap, just because of how um, how temperatures rise over the course of the day and the incredible influence of the very cold ocean current there um, in the West, that means that there's a really intense ocean influence through this whole region. And you can see that Armand Vineyard is right in the throat of Petaluma Gap. And so has, and is it's really actually, almost impossible to plant further west than that in that little pet gap area because of the soil types, but also because it's so incredibly cold. And so that section there um, where our, our mob vineyard is located gets a really, really intense nightly fog and um, that lasts quite late into morning, but does have some wind influence as well. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's around what, 10 miles from the from the ocean, uh, there are many similarities uh, with this and Rim Rock because they both, this is uh, I think like a volcanic soil um, and it's kind of iron rich, so acidic soils, they both are acidic soils. They both are fermented 100% whole cluster. They both have old barrels. Uh, they both are fermented in concrete. Uh, Pax is wine is uh, slightly, uh, slightly um, um, less time. It's it, he bottles most of his Syrahs within the calendar year, mm -hmm. uh, so hence the bottles will have. And of course, it's both the wines are unfiltered, unfiltered, and just a touch softer, so there's more sedimentation in Pax's wine. But truly, I mean, I mean, you know, we. I mean, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> Step on anyone's toes, but Pinot Noir is what the favorite grape is of the Sonoma Coast. But now more and more we are seeing uh, Syrah pop up, and this might happen in other places with this um, with this pattern. Uh, of, and there's a lot of now at this point there's a lot of really really great Syrah on the coast in, in, in Sonoma and uh, a little bit in Santa Cruz, and then of course uh, down here. Uh, there's a Syrah even planted, vineyard planted just opposite Domingo de la Cote. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. But again, these vineyards only ripen um, because of the yield. Uh, they, they won't hang a, a big yield. So I don't, I don't think many commercial producers will be planting Syrah. But, yeah. but, but again, this Syrah, you have it blind next to... I mean, it's kind of ironic. If you actually put the 17, 17 Syrahs blind next to 17 Northern Rhones, which are much riper, 18 Northern Rhones in Rhone, again, quite ripe. And that's the weather pattern. So this is, uh, you can see kind of an old style Northern yes. Rhone Syrah coming out of California. Well, the aromatics on this are ma from Pax are just completely off the hook. It's like, <laughs> it was like, it's so clearly Syrah. And I think one of the, things that's really important to point out here is we're talking about whole cluster on both of these wines, but there, there's nothing about them that I would call stemmy. You know, it's really like what, like this, the second wine, especially is like almost wild in its character and like really like those sweet Italian herbs, like sweet Italian sausage, you know, really, they're both quite meaty and, and a little bit floral, really aromatic. Um, and, uh, but again, incredibly lifted and light wines. And for me, it's so exciting to find that combination where the wine is energizing and energetic and really fresh and lifted and dynamic, but then all still quite light on the palate as yeah. well. Having so much flavor with so little weight, it's really exciting. And it seems to me that that really speaks to the coastal aspect of these wines as well, yeah. that that combination is something you can find in more coastal vineyards. Do you see that as well? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it, it has that smoky and peppery and and that kind of bacon fat stuff you want from Syrah, but it's also, it's ripe. It's not, it's not you know, it, it has a green of bergamot and oolong, mm -hmm. not a 
green beans and asparagus, yeah, yeah. which you can get. And that's just how the yields are managed. And that's just how, you know, I mean, you know, Pax is very involved. Uh, you know, he lives not far away. So he's, he's him, him and the team are definitely involved in, in, the, in the viticulture and, and really making the wine. And same with Sashi, um, you know, spending so many years. I mean, the, both these guys are, you know, have made Syrah, uh, Sashi's made Syrah since <laughs> at, at, um, uh, at uh, Ojai with Adam Tomac and then Stopman for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But this is a very different course of Syrah. And Pax also, Pax is uh, making Syrah for well, 20 years at least. Yeah, um, he, they both really got started with Syrah actually and yeah. started making other things after. And it's funny, they both had a different style. I mean, let's come back to that. They both made... Completely different wines, it, yeah. And, you know, I mean, not, again, not to criticize, yeah. but they both were also good friends with Robert Parker and, and they, and then they both kind of departed from that style and went into more of a, you know, cause I called Sashi out once. I'm like, you know, we, we are drinking some shentas. He's like, Oh yeah, I like Koro tea. I'm like, yeah, but your Syrah is not like Koro tea. Yeah. And he's like, Oh yeah, right. And then he didn't say anything. And, you know, and I think, I don't know, Pax came to me once when I was working in my Camina and he had started Wind Gap and he was like, yeah, all my, he knew I didn't like the big rich style. He's like, oh yeah, we have this kind of new wine, coastal vineyards and spicy and fresh. And so, yeah, that's how me and Pax connected because, you know, again, I, I, I never ever held back my thoughts on wine and, and uh, the style I liked. And I'm happy that it's, uh, it's what it's what is, uh, I mean, not, again, it's a very small, th these wines are in tiny quantities. Yes, yeah. But this is not the style of Cali all of California. This is like a little drop in the bucket, but it's still a good, you know, I'm proud to, uh, you know, represent these as California wines because they're, you know, I, I'm tonight going to sit down and, you know, enjoy these, drinking these wines. Uh, so, yeah. One of the things too, I mean, so just to clarify a, in relation to a question that's coming in, you know, as you're saying, these, these are, these, wines have to be made in smaller quantities because the yields have to be lower on the vine to ripen. Syrah is a really quite a late ripening variety. And it is often to get wines of this kind of character, it's often planted in areas that Pinot also grows. But Pinot is an incredibly early ripening variety, one of the earliest picks of the year. And so it's it's easier to get Pinot ripe in comparison because of that. Um, usually by the time Syrah is coming in, the weather's changed. And, and so, um, so a lot of the, in terms of where Pinot is planted versus Syrah, a lot of it's that, but, but um, because Pinot comes in earlier, it's, it's comparatively easier to make a, a kind of livable um, income from Pinot. And again, comparatively easier. Pinot, as we know, is challenging to grow in its own right, but, but Syrah coming in late and it needs lower yields. And so it's, a, it's much um, harder to bring in. But, but um, at that said, you know, I think the quality and character potential for Syrah in California and especially these colder areas is just off the hook. Like it could be, I think Syrah, Syrah in California has the potential to be among the, some of the greatest wines in the world, but it's, it's about making it work too. There's a lot of other factors that, that play in. One of the, it, experiences I had with you though too is is actually very much as you were just saying about food and wine pairing um you know I several years ago I was able to have dinner in your home with you and your mom and she had flown over from India to stay for a month or so and um and so the two of you invited me to dinner and the meal that we had had been made by your mom and it was this lamb dish that takes three days to make and so when you had initially called to invite me, you said, well, you could come tonight, but you should come tomorrow because this food will be ready then, <laughs> this three-day dish. And um, this was several years ago now before you'd opened um, the restaurant there in Santa Barbara, but we actually spent the evening talking about pairing Syrah with Indian food, which is something that now has been talked about a little bit, thanks to you and an article Eric Asimov wrote about it, but really... At the time, I had never even considered the idea, and I think is really quite an unexpected pairing. So, could you just talk about about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, growing up, I didn't drink wine, but when my mom started coming 
and visiting me uh, and spending a month here. And I almost, you know, I was like, wow, this is like, I always kind of went towards whole cluster Syrah. I'm like, it's gonna, you know, because eating like, I don't eat much meat, but when she makes that dish, one specific dish, it's like, it's just the best with Syrah. You, of course, lamb so and good. Syrah was always a combination, which, which was known for many, many years. But then with the spices, but also works with a specific kind of Syrah more, uh, you know, because there is some heat, which mostly on black pepper, and Syrah has black pepper notes also. Uh, lower alcohol wines work better with kind of anything spicy. So again, when you're dealing with wines like these and many other Syrahs around the world, which are, you know, not 15% alcohol, more 13% alcohol, 12 or 13, it just works really well. The spices, the wines taste really vibrant and accentuates in the, in the, the spices in the food, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a great example though too of how, you know, as our public or social understanding of wine has really evolved, thanks in part to, uh, you know, there being more, more influences from different parts of the world and, and more people from different food backgrounds, like thinking differently about wine, you know, um, yeah. your background with food there in India and just the kinds of spices and fruits and flavors that you're exposed to brings a really different perspective to kind of what you see wine as and, and how it might work in relation to food as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, I think it's important because we do eat and drink together. I mean, it's, it's the best way to, to do both. Um, so we're almost out of time, but do you have any um, kind of further comments about how you see wines like this um, in relation to, to kind of um, California on the global stage? One of the important things I want to highlight again is that, you know, you were talking about with the Pedro Sassi, we tend to think of Syrah in relation to France, but actually in that case, some of the inspiration came from Spain there in Galicia, which is, you know, it's a great reminder of how many different sources for inspiration and tradition there really, there really are. But do you have any other, you know, Syrah of course has grown all around the world. And it, my impression is that here in California, we're still really discovering its potential. Sure. Do you have any further comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I also something, you know, with Syrah, you have to be a little bit more patient. It's not, you know, uh, of course, some Syrahs you can drink young, but the more serious Syrahs, you know, you need minimum five years. And maybe that's, you know, one of the uh, sore points in the selling part of Syrah that, it, you know, you just can't crack up on a 2018 and say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, some of them could be great, but they do need a little bit of time, a little bit of kind of cellaring. Um, and again, people who sometimes don't like heavy, rich wines, they might go for, you know, they, they might not enjoy it. I think give it five years of age and you really see five plus. These wines will age a long, long time. I opened a 2011 uh, Rim Rock uh, during the lockdown and I drank that over two days and it was incredible. Uh, at you know nine years old, there was no development. It was still fresh and, and vibrant. So I think that is something. And I also opened a 13, um, 13 Syrah from Pax and the same kind of, you know, still very fresh. And I put it, put them next to, I did a flight of other Rhone wines, very, you know, uh, famous Rhone wines. And, and they all kind of like sang. It was, you could not tell. Uh, any age and all these wines and it was pretty cool to see that. I think one of the other things that's good to point out here too that's sort of implied in a lot of what you're saying but Syrah really in terms of growing potential and style range it's really actually one of the most versatile varieties that you know it, it actually can be made well and grow well from you know really light crunchy fresh whole cluster or not, all the way to, to riper, fuller bodied as well. And, and, and then where you want to fall in that range really comes down to personal preference, but quality potential across that range is really quite high and it, it can grow in a range of, of places as well. So, you know, we're talking about um, th these coastal examples, but there's, there are a lot of other parts of California that can do quite well with Syrah in other styles as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we are out of time, but I want to thank you so much for, for making time and selecting these wines for us to talk about. And, you know, as I have mentioned, the, the kind of perspective you're able to bring to a conversation like that because of, you know, 
you're, you're such a unique combination of really extensive um, restaurant experience, tasting experience through the restaurant of really wines from all over the world. But then also, you know, intimate knowledge and, and connection to producers literally all over the world. We've spoken about France, but we could have gone on just as long about Chile, Australia, you know, um, you know, Oregon. And, um, and then also to have experience making wine in Oregon, California, and France. It's really quite a unique combination that you bring. So thank you so much to um, spending time. And also, I know a lot of people are thanking you um, in the chat section right now for spending so much time on Syrah. A lot of a lot of us wine lovers have a Syrah as a favorite, but it tends not to be talked about as much. So thank you. Um, thanks for being with us today. For a change, not talking about Pinot Noir. So. <laughs> we love Pinot, but it gets a lot of attention. Yeah. Great. Good. Thank you to everybody for being with us today. Um, it's always a pleasure to see the different countries dialing in. So thank you again to everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Raj. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days, and all participants will receive an email with that link. And we hope that you will join us next week as we continue this new chapter of Behind the Wines uh, with Eric Asimov, chief, chief wine critic for the New York Times. He will join Elaine on Tuesday, July 14th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.